Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's latest ECA Learning Zone webinar, all about developments in electrical surges and lighting today. Our presentation today is brought to you by ECA Commercial Associate Red Arrow. Uh, we're delighted to have their sales director, Graham Lewis, and their marketing manager, Dave Oakley, on the call today. They will be your main presenters. We also have ECA's own technical manager, Gary Parker, who I'll hand over to very shortly. Uh, but before I do that, just a reminder that you can use the questions box, uh, the uh, little question mark on your screen at any time during today's presentation, and our presenters will try to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Today's session is recorded, and a full replay will be available on ECA's YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash ECA live. Be sure to also check out our other replays from the entire ECA Learning Zone series so far, covering a very broad range of other technical and business topics. And with that said, I hope you enjoy today's session. And over to you, Gary. Thank you, Omar, and good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've been enjoying the beautiful weather we've experienced over the last few weeks. Now, as most people know, a light is just a light. Well, it isn't, is it? We actually know it isn't just that. Maybe 30 years ago, it could have been. But nowadays, the advancement in technology, the uses, LEDs, it means that there's a vast, vast difference in terms of lights, lighting and options out there. And it also means that we as an industry need to be educated in the different types of lights, the different natures of them, why they are different price and why they do different things. So today we've got a really good and useful presentation that uh, Red Arrow are going to deliver on the different types of lights, the, the different scopes and the specifications of them, and why we as contractors need to educate our clients in the fact that a light isn't a light. There are differences and there will be differences, and that will be reflected in price, but also reflected in quality too. So I'd like to hand over to Graham now to take the presentation on and hopefully you'll all have a great session. Are you there, Graham? Oh, I certainly am. Thank you very much, Gary. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, pal. I'll hand over to you. Fabulous. Thank you. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so what I'm going to try and cover today is um, the types of electrical surges with relationship to lighting and how it affects lighting and explain a little bit about the, the mystique around what effects a light fitting. Before I start that, um, just to explain a little bit about the business of Red Arrow um, as it stands today and as it used to be. So let's um, kind of just rewind a little bit and go to the old business of Red Arrow Trading. Some of you may know the name uh, of the lighting manufacturer. The lighting manufacturer was um, well, originally a distributor and not a manufacturer. It was formed in 1999. It operated until the end of April 2019. Um, it started actually uh, selling uh, rubber bands and jiffy bags into schools, packaging and presentation materials, and then it diversified into lighting and lamps. Uh, and it was an early adopter of LED luminaires in the wholesale market, um, supplying to electrical wholesalers for the electrical contractors. It had a reputation for a low cost product um, and holding high levels of stock and, and fast deliveries. Um, but it was uh, very much seen as a, as a low cost supplier. The business changed in uh, May 2019 um, when it was acquired um, by uh, the current um, directors of the business, um, Michael Crossley, the managing director, uh, Graham Lewis, myself as sales director, and Andy Hisco as the operations director. And um, we had a strategy to invest in the business, and this was um, an acquisition of, of asset rather than the actual trading business itself. So it was a brand new business. Um, but we had uh, a plan to take the business away from being a, a low cost importer into a trusted manufacturer. Um, our background was uh, lighting. Um, so, uh, my personal history was a long time at Osram. The other uh, director's personal histories were with Crompton and Cooper Lighting and Crompton Lamps. 
We also have some of our tech, technical expertise and product marketing from Whitecroft Lighting. Um, and we've now developed into an ISO 9001 business. Um, we're involved with the ECA, obviously, as you know now, we're also LIA members. Uh, and we have our own manufacturing um, facility, uh, which was, was set up at the end of 2019. Uh, and our own um, facilities for reworking and um, product modifications. We are very much a, a lighting focused um, manufacturing business and would happily get involved in uh, discussing that with any electrical contractors. So to move on to the basis of the presentation um, for this afternoon, um, electrical surges and how they affect lighting. Hopefully what I'm going to cover um, are the points now. Um, what types of electrical surges do we have? Uh, what damage can they cause? What are the differences between them um, and, and the differences in terms of how they affect traditional light sources and light fittings and LED lighting? Uh, and why for those products is it important to produce them with suitable surge protection or have suitable surge protection in the circuitry? What solutions can be offered for surge protection for lighting? And then I'll open it up to questions. So what are electrical surges? Well, for fear of uh, teaching grandma how to suck eggs, I'm sure everybody listening today um, understands a little bit of electrical surges, um, but I'm going to try and put the, the twist on this in terms of um, what they are in terms of the relationship to lighting. Um, but electrical surges or transient over voltages are voltage spikes on power uh, or on signals or telecommunication lines that uh, can overload components. Um, lightning is, is one of the ones that is frequently um, referred to and lightning can uh, affect um, uh, an installation even up to something like a one kilometre away, depending upon the, the power of the pulse of the, the lightning surge. Uh, and that can have devastating results um, for most electronic components. Um, however, um, surges are also caused by large grid connected equipment, um, such as um, motors. Um, for example, if you have a, a lift operating um, and you have um, the lift starting and stopping, um, and if you have a compressor that is starting and stopping, maybe cutting um, metal or cutting timber or something like that, and you're using compressor machinery, they send all surges down uh, to the, to the uh, grid connected equipment uh, and that can um, have long term stressing effects on the electronic components. The result there is disruption, degradation and damage of the product. Um, it's actually quite difficult to see that on the initial um, pulse that has been caused. It's quite often very difficult to actually measure the pulse that is caused, um, but it has a, a degrading effect to the whole system and obviously leads to downtime within the system itself. What sort of damage can be caused? Well, um, transient over voltages significantly damage and degrade electronic systems. Um, outright damage to sensitive electronic systems such as computers occur when transient over voltages exceed the withstand voltage of the electrical equipment. Um, equipment damage leads to unexpected failures and expensive downtime or risk of fire and in some instances, instances electric shock due to flashover if the insulation breaks down. Degradation of electronic systems, however, begins at much lower over voltage levels and can cause data losses um, on computers or sometimes intermittent outages on the electronic components running lighting, for example. Um, where continuous operation of electronic systems is critical, um, places like hospitals, banking and most public services, um, you would obviously look to avoid um, the degradation um, by fitting suitable surge protection devices. Um, and, and obviously calculations can be made to take that into account, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, not exactly a spike in the traditional sense, but a brownout can have an effect uh, on switch mode power supplies, which uh, generally LED drivers are. Um, as the input voltage fails, the current draw will increase to maintain the same output voltage and current until such a point that the power supply will malfunction. Uh, so let's use an example and say on 110 volt start lighting, if, um, if a driver isn't designed to operate on dual, dual voltage and um, 
most of them that are marked as yellow tend to be 110 volt only. And then if, if something happens in, in that, obviously the consequences would mean damage to the componentry. And in long term, it will destroy the driver. And if the driver is destroyed, then the product itself won't operate. It doesn't always immediately manifest itself. So it causes electronic overstress in various components uh, in the product. Uh, and that will lead to long term issues to the, um, to the, uh, the products themselves and cause intermittent failure. Um, you can, in extreme cases, um, see it uh, as burnt out components. Um, and quite often that tends to be the point where uh, the light fitting itself um, is blamed for those failures. So hopefully we've covered the type of um, failures. And sometimes, as I said, you know, it will be uh, component damages causing mid to long term failures. Uh, and in other extremes, if it is a particularly powerful spike, then it will cause catastrophic failure where the product will fail completely. So let's rewind a little bit. What are the differences between traditional and LED lighting? We often get asked, um, why do we have problems with LED fittings that we didn't have with traditional uh, light fittings? Well, in simple terms, um, it's the differences of the componentry. Uh, traditional discharge light sources, for example, fluorescent tubes and high intensity discharge lamps, were often controlled by a wire wound transformer. And really a, a voltage spike hitting a wire wound transformer would cause nothing more um, than the, uh, the transformer itself to absorb it. Uh, long term, if it was being hit by uh, voltage uh, spikes, it would perhaps cause the laminations to degrade given time and eventually the light fitting would fail. Uh, converting um, traditional light sources to electronic control gear, such as the, the product you can see on the slide at the moment with uh, the Phillips header on it, um, would, would actually um, operate in a similar way in as much as it did have some transformer components, but then this was a bit of a hybrid where it had also a lot of electronic components. And front end in a lot of these, they had some kind of fusing device, which was a non-replaceable fuse or a non-rewirable fuse, which I'll come on to later on. The difference between that and LED lighting is LED lighting is solid state. So instead of a discharge light tube, a gas-based discharge light tube, or even a filament to absorb the voltage spike, you're talking about solid state lighting components and solid state electronic components within the transformers or drivers as they're typically called now. And uh, those solid state components are pretty much the same types of components that you would see inside mobile phones and inside computers, um, albeit very much on a uh, downscaled basis because obviously the, the cost of the, the componentry uh, used inside LED light fittings will, will probably be slightly less than the cost used inside uh, the latest Samsung or uh, Apple phone technologies. Um, it, it means that basically we're talking about something that is that is um, very similar, as I said, to computer or television technology. And in computer and tele television technology, it is very common that surge protection devices are fitted uh, inside the product itself. Uh, or major surge protection devices um, traditionally used to be fitted to the actual power cable supplying um, the product itself. And it's very much a matter of cost based um, as to if you're talking about a 500 pound um, piece of uh, computer equipment um, or a 50 pound piece of uh, LED lighting. And it is, you know, obviously then down to the fact that um, we see LED light fittings today as being LED light fittings. Um, and yes, they're using the solid state lighting component that is an LED chip, um, but then it comes down to very much the componentry that is actually controlling um, those LED light sources. There are different types, and there are driver on board technology, which may have some rudimental um, uh, electronic components to operate uh, a set number of LEDs. 
uh, or there will be separate drivers and more sophisticated um, dimmable controlled drivers as well, which would have uh, very much more componentry. So why is it important to use suitable surge protection for LEDs? Well, it's a critical factor because we're using electronic equipment. It's electronic componentry. It's solid state lighting. Chips and circuit boards are the important things that we're using here. So we could choose some solutions to that. Um, and within lighting products, there tends to be one of three different routes that we would take as a lighting manufacturer. And again, very much all cost focused. Rudimentary protection means there is a component within the product that would actually um, fail and would safeguard against um, any short circuiting or fire uh, caused within the actual remaining components in the driver. Um, a common next step is to actually mount a fuse of some type, whether that's an electronic fuse or whether it's just a simple fuse, exactly as we know um, fuses are in uh, things like plugs or whatever. Um, and those fuses are usually non-replaceable and non-rewirable. And then there's the, uh, the next style, which is resettable protection. So uh, that can manifest itself in one of a couple of ways. It could be um, as it detects the surge, uh, the resettable protection um, clicks into operation. Then you have to power down the installation and power up the installation again, and then the, uh, the fuse will reset. In some instances, um, there will be a reignition circuitry built into the driver, and the reignition circuitry will automatically um, have a period of downtime, and then it will try to restrike the product itself uh, and strike up without the need of actually powering down and powering back up again. And it is, as I said, very much a, a case of, um, of choice. And I'll give you a few examples here, um, the sort of good, better, best componentry. Uh, and there are two high bay fittings shown here. And these happen to be two of our high bay fittings. One is called a UFOX and one is called a, a COM HB. Um, UFOX has um, the fuse um, within it, which is a non-rewirable fuse within it because it is a sealed IP65 product and it will just protect the fitting um, from any more catastrophic failure other than just being hit by the, the voltage spike and going out. COMHB has the next level of um, protection uh, and that is uh, very much a, um, a resettable fuse inside the, the, the product itself. The difference is, is that in, in simple terms, and I'm, you know, I'm not quoting exact prices, but in simple terms, one is almost twice the price of the other product, uh, which kind of just you know, comes back to the explanation of you can have uh, an LED product, which is assumed it's LED, it, therefore it must be the same. Um, but the depth of componentry that goes into the, the driver that is actually controlling the product uh, will very much make the difference. And yes, you can engineer life into that as well. You can also engineer in things like surge protection to the products. That could even be applicable to 110 volt site lighting. And you'll see in a lot of manufacturers' data uh, and, uh, and also information on websites that they will actually say surge protected uh, within the fittings. So you get an idea that the product has some kind of surge protection. The other way around that is just cut costs, cut corners, and not have any surge protection at all, and depend upon, of course, a surge protection device being installed in the service entrance point um, to protect against uh, any serious damage of the, uh, uh, of the products that are actually in circuit. Within the product ranges that um, Red Arrow have, um, whether it's commercial lighting, whether it's down lights, emergency lighting, industrial lighting, or site lighting, uh, exterior flood lighting, uh, we will have uh, different levels of products as most manufacturers do. Uh, and we will clearly state whether there is surge protection, but obviously we can always have uh, uh, questions that can be fired to us. Um, and, uh, and explain whether or not these products have some kind of surge protection. 
I hope that in the time that I've had here, I've explained to you um, some of the differences and um, I'd like to then pass this over to questions, if I can. Thank you very much, Graham. A really great presentation there. Um, before we move into the uh, audience questions, uh, Gary, I think you had a couple of points that you wanted to make, is that right? Yeah, thanks, Oman. Thanks for that, Graham. Um, just a, a, a quick question for Graham and his technical team, if you could. Um, do you guys ever notice uh, problems with startup surging? I know you've been talking about surging as in lightning or man-made effects, but startup surging of the LEDs. Have you seen that in your equipment any time? Yeah, well, perhaps what I'll do is I'll pass over. I have Paul Yarnell with me, who is our technical manager, and um, I'll pass that one over to Paul, who will answer that for you. Hello. Hello. Hi there, Paul. Yep, far away. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do have instances where the startup current has become an issue and you get nuisance tripping on the uh, MCB. Um, I'm always asked the question is, can I increase the size of the MCB or can I even go from a, a B curve to a C curve, C curve to a D curve? My answer is always, that's not my decision, that's your decision because you, you're going to test the circuit for your disconnection times and your your Z and you're going to work that out so I can never say that what I can say is to negate or mitigate any nuisance tripping especially that with the high base is you can either have them all individually switched by a sensor per fitting and the chance of them all coming on at the same time is very remote or there is surge um, inhibitors that we've supplied before which basically are like a smart relay and they will only switch them on at the zero crossover point of the sinusoidal wave. So when you switch them on, they're only going to all come on at that point, which you've got 50 of those. Well, in theory, you've got 25 of them per um, second. Does that answer the question, Gary? It certainly does, yeah. That sounds like a really uh, a convenient solution. I have seen some literature out there saying certain manufacturers will recommend only having a set number of fittings. Uh, some of them were ridiculously low. One, one I saw had a, a maximum of eight light on a circuit for startup surge. So to have that facility sounds really good. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this is one instance where um, the, 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 the breaker was tripping every time you turned it on. Um, and the only way to, need to negate that was to have the um, surge arrestor or inhibitor, if you like. And do you guys specify any particular surge protection device or location of it, or do you again leave that one up to the designer? Versions, and it's the manufacturer of the, uh, or the brand of driver, and it's the same brand because they've obviously highlighted the problem. Um, with them, because they, I mean, the inrush current is, can be 70 amps, but for a microsecond, for just that initial surge that causes the tripping. Um, and we, we, we've supplied them, and there's two versions. You can either have a DIN rail type, which can go into the consumer unit at the side of the circuit, or there's a self contained version that can go local to the fitting. Real, thank you. And have you guys got any? Um... I know this is probably a bit of an open-ended question, but any really popular lights at the moment, what do you find is the people are asking for the most at the minute? Oh, crikey, that's a, that's a very difficult question, Gary. It tends to shift with the seasons, to be perfectly honest. So what we have seen recently, um, obviously after coming out of um, a lot of the restrictions, is um, in the last few months, a huge uptake in sight lighting. Um, so there's been a there's been a huge amount of, uh, of uptake in sight lighting, particularly LED festoons, um, as opposed to the old traditional style bayonet cap festoons with an LED lamp inside it, um, actually having solid state modules built into the LED festoons. Um, and and now we're we're seeing um, a, a lot of popularity for um, color temperature switching. Uh, although we are still a little bit mystified by colour temperature switching in as much as if, if you know what the installation is going to actually offer, 
you know, do you need 4,000 Kelvin or do you need 3,000 Kelvin? You would probably know beforehand. Um, and we've also seen a trend in, in retrofitting terms um, to using uh, LEDs now to replace uh, a lot of bulkhead um, type products. Uh, and we have a lot of ready-made retrofit solutions for, for old 2D bulkheads. And uh, again, that's a, that's a very popular area at the moment where still in school and um, in retail and um, retail applications in uh, back of house retail applications there still seems to be um, hundreds of thousands if not possibly even millions of um, 2d fittings that are that are still having retrofitted product inside them and, and that's a full gear tray that uh, that we've seen a huge uptake in in recent months The, um, the the best in lighting that you mentioned there, the use of LED, are you finding they're more robust on site? They have a, a better shelf life? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Gary. Um, the thing um, with, I mean, obviously the traditional way of doing it with, with the old type rough service lamps to try and deal with um, uh, the filament being um, shaken um, and also um, something which... Uh, always used to get joked about in lamp circles was a terminology called filament droop, um, where they would be mounted horizontally and the, uh, the actual cause of gravity uh, on a filament would cause the filament to actually come under pressure because it wasn't meant to be operated uh, in that position. Of course, all of those things are totally immaterial to an LED. Um, and in, in simple terms, the LED itself as a solid state component um, although we see them as white LEDs, um, the LED is actually blue. Um, and then um, we put phosphors in front of the LEDs, um, which can often be seen as a yellow, um, but it's actually red and green phosphor mixed together to produce the yellow. Um, so it's, it's a simple way of, uh, of like mixing paints. Uh, and that is obviously then um, coated um, either on or remotely, depending upon the technology that's being used in front of the blue LED to produce the white light. There is no filament inside there. There are also no um, components that can be easily destroyed by movement, knocks, those kind, kinds of things, uh, because it is a tiny solid state component. So what we're seeing is it's very much more robust. A lot of the um, LED uh, products that are then being used by site lighting specialists uh, we're finding are actually uh, being reused on a number of occasions and it certainly seems to be a more popular way of doing it and certainly has been a big turnaround for us. We've stopped doing anything with, with uh, any kind of retrofitable um, product inside uh, the actual uh, festoon itself and just had these modules, uh, the LED modules themselves. So yeah, very to answer, probably a long-winded way of me answering it, but it, yeah, very much more robust um, and obviously you can stand up to the rigours of being on site a lot better than the traditional types of festoons were. And brilliant, thanks for that, Graham. And just one more question. Um, I started off at the, at the very beginning saying about not all lights are the same and there is a difference. I guess that's, that's fair to say in your products. You mentioned one is, is pretty much twice the price of the other. Is, is there justified reasons why somebody would spend more in certain circumstances and why they, the client should be made aware of the differences and what the benefits are of the more expensive or better value for money products? Yeah, sure. I'm, well, I can use, you know, again, without, you know, sort of going on in, in detail about lots of different products within our range. So I'll refer back to the, the images that I had in the presentation of the, the high bay and a site um, that we had experience of um, with one of our, um, fundamental high base. So I said, you know, there were two products there, but we have three different types of high base. Uh, and basically that had the rudimental, you know, component that would, um, would fail with a voltage surge. Um, they had issues with compressors on site. Um, they wanted to replace 20 year old lighting uh, that was on site using HIDs with um, wire wound transformers that had been failing, the access was an issue. Um, so they chose uh, the cheapest possible route um, to actually go to a basic light fitting 
that was going to last for you know essentially three years for them if it was operated uh, constantly uh, and just had rudimental protection even though on site um, they had these issues with these compressors going off and the big um, uh, the big machinery operating uh, they're now in a, in a position where what they're doing is they're considering whether or not they put in uh, full-blown surge protection devices or whether they upgrade um, essentially two levels uh, to a product with um, a, a resettable uh, surge protector inside it um, and the componentry then is you know while you're actually you know putting in things like you know, um, high level surge protection devices like a resettable one uh, you're also going to add in to uh, that componentry that will last for uh, longer periods. LEDs themselves will typically last for hundreds of thousands of hours. Um, but a white LED, because as I've mentioned about the phosphor coating, will go blue in time because the phosphor will gradually degrade. Um, the electronic components inside um, the driver itself will be the components that will give it ultimately its finite life. So if they want something to last for five years and not have to maintain it for five years uh, and not fit um, surge protection um, at the, the, the service entry point, um, then, then obviously they could spend the additional money with it, within the product itself, the fitting itself, to give them a longer service life um, and and obviously, if they have a longer service life and the resettable fuses um, inside the or resettable surge protection, sorry, inside the product, then you know, then it, obviously it's money well spent. But it is very much a, a matter of cost, Gary. So so that's that's the difference. Is that you know you're absolutely right. You know, um, LED, you know and as both you and I have said, you know, there's you know everyone sort of assumes that LEDs are LEDs, and of course the LEDs themselves are but there are also even different grades of the leds themselves um, and that doesn't really affect their life that just affects their performance in this instance we're talking about the performance of the componentry within the driver that's actually controlling it and, and that's where very much the cost comes into it and it's a little bit like a, a basic mobile phone and the difference between a basic mobile phone and the latest touch screen technology with a large organic LED screen and all the componentry that goes with it that means that the microprocessor inside it runs that, that phone far more sophisticatedly than the basic touchscreen phone that we used to have for £30 a few years ago. Uh, again, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Graham. Um, Omar, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And uh, thanks again to Graham and his colleague Paul for uh, that really kind of in-depth discussion, really informative presentation as well. Um, there aren't any uh, questions from the audience, at least none that haven't been covered already in, uh, in our, our discussion just now. So we will wrap up the presentation there for today. Uh, big thanks once again to our audience and to our presenters and a uh, Final question from me, uh, Graham. Where can our viewers and our members find out more about Red Arrow? Okay, um, very much the, the simplest place is coming to our website, um, and uh, that is www.redarrowelectrical.co.uk. Um, and I would also invite anybody locally um, that wants to, um, there is an open day on the 30th of July to our new um, uh, warehouse and, and office facilities, our rework facilities here. And if anybody um, within the audience that's listening would like an invite, um, by all means, they can contact me. Uh, and if they email me at sales at redarrowelectrical .co.uk, um, I can make contact with them and send them out an invite and we'd be delighted to see them on the day. Great, thank you Graham. And uh, for those of you watching this on the YouTube replay, all those details will be in the description below the video. Um, thanks once again to everyone and we'll uh, close the webinar there for today and have a great rest of your day.